You want to know a luxury modern PC gamers like to take for granted? Controls. What I mean by that is that you can be fairly confident that if you switch from one game to another, the control scheme will be fairly similar. This trend even transcends genre and game style. Top-down battle royale game, third-person role-playing game, modern 2D platformer, first-person shooter… All of these seemingly incredibly different games feel similar on the hands and more importantly on the mind. This was definitely not always the case. Go back in the PC game timeline only a little bit to find games like Doom. Doom is a groundbreaking game which is incredibly still fun to play today. But holy shit, playing it in 2021 feels like you're trying to control the game with your hands reversed and upside down. It isn't even bad, it's just so different and so unintuitive to the modern gamer. But thankfully we're past that era, and games now have an almost universal language that most gamers are fluent in. However, because that language exists, a brand new subgenre of indie games has emerged. You see, some devs don't want their game to revolve around mastering unintuitive controls. Others, however, well that's the main focus of their game, and also what I'm going to talk about. I don't really know how to feel about lots of these games. On one hand, I absolutely hate it. They feel like I'm inside a dream, where my intent and desires are only half fulfilled. Like when you're running in a dream, but you feel like you're underwater. But on the other hand, it's refreshing to have these experiences. And as frustrating as they are, overcoming the obstacles leads to a great amount of pride. As far as I know, there isn't a single AAA game that has weird controls on purpose. And for good reason, they can't afford the time sink into what is essentially the digital equivalent of a gag gift. So I'll primarily focus on indie games. Now we separate them into two different categories. In category 1 we have unintuitive controls, and in the smaller but still frequent category 2 we have random or RNG controls. Bennett Foddy is notorious for making games with unintuitive controls. They're weird and frustrating and can feel random at times, but they're consistently consistent. They're unintuitive, not random. Quop or QWOP's goal is to get to 100 meters. But that isn't really what the goal is. The goal is to figure out the super unintuitive game mechanics. The 100 meter sprint is just a test to see if you have. Honestly, that number could have been 50, 150, 1000. By the time you master the controls, it doesn't matter what the number is. Uh, though, to be fair, maybe 1000 would take way too much time. Another example by Mr. Foddy is getting over it. Again, the controls are extremely unintuitive, weird, frustrating, and seemingly random. But they are consistent. That hammer will move in a very, very bizarre manner, but it will move in that bizarre manner every time you move it that way. Because of this, complete mastery is achievable for humans. Check out this speedrun of getting over it. This is peak mastery of super unintuitive controls and it is unfathomable to us who haven't attempted to master the controls. So how about random controls? Well, I kinda like them to be honest. Randomness has always existed in games. I mean like shit, a dice is the main game mechanic of Dungeons & Dragons. Think games like Human Fall Flat, or Human Fall Flat Online, or Tabs. The controls are somewhat intuitive on the hands, but the same cannot be said on the mind. You have to seriously change the way you approach these games or else you'll get frustrated a lot. You got the standard WASD to move, but the controls are still random, and you know what? It's fun. You can still for sure influence your movement, the controls are still, you know, controls. You still have control, but the physics is random. All of these bad control games are like ugly Christmas sweaters. Their controls are intentionally bad, so does that make them bad controls? These game controls have bad attributes, they're unintuitive, they feel weird and clunky, they often have random physics, and yet all of that is done so knowingly. No mistakes or oversights made, this is the intended experience. They really do feel like digital gag gifs. Well here you go. Another interesting question I've seen raised was what quantity of positive attributes are required to constitute a game as being good in the sense that a majority of people can agree on. Imagine a game with a boring story, bland graphics, annoying soundtracks, and intentionally weird controls as the main selling point. We can all agree this hypothetical game is bad, but now make all of those attributes just average or mediocre except for the eccentric controls. Is this a, a good game? A bad game? An average game? Without context we can't tell at all, but it's still something to think about. I already see you in the comments going on about the subjectivity of believing a game is good or bad, and you're right, honestly. There's nothing you can call objectively good or bad, but just calm down there, philosophy major, alright? The point is that if a game's main draw is the weird controls, is that a good thing or a bad thing? The answer is that it's neither good nor bad, it's just different. And being different isn't good or bad, being different is different. 
If you want to say that a game being unique is bad because it does so in a very predictable way and makes the gameplay experience unenjoyable to you as a result, then I get that. Think for a second, noise music. That's noise music. It's abrasive and harsh and downright unlistenable, but you can't deny it's an extremely interesting and different listen. A critique of noise music is that it relies solely off the shock value, off the quality of being different, and that it's so desperate to be different it would intentionally cast away any possible enjoyment. You can certainly make up your own mind whether or not you agree on that, I'm personally pretty indifferent, but I bring it up because of how those exact critiques translate over to intentionally bad controls, despite how ironically many of these games are oddly charming and beautiful in stark contrast to, uh... <laughs> And I think it'd be irresponsible to leave out the fact that just as there are people that unironically enjoy noise music just as being noise music, there are people that unironically enjoy these games with bad controls, even taking away all the frustration, they just enjoy the game mechanics. Now if you want to say that these types of games are good because it acts as a palate cleanser for your video game experience, that's also okay. And I would have to agree with you because that's my main use of these games on the off chance I do play them. Your brain lingers, brains do that. Switching between games of similar genres can be easy, but a lot of games aren't. Swap between CSGO and a tower defense game or a real-time strategy game in the span of maybe three minutes. It feels weird on your mind. Put one of these dumpster games in the middle for 10 or 20 minutes and suddenly the switch feels way easier on the brain. This is a lot more anecdotal though, just my own personal use and experience of these games with bad controls, and you might not agree at all with what I just said. I know there are lots of people that can just put down the game for 10 or 20 minutes and jump back into a completely different game unscathed. I can't really do that, and I'm sure a lot of other people can't. But one thing we can all agree on is that these games are frustrating. <laughs> In a good way, this is a great point in favor of these games actually. The fun of these games lies within the frustration. It's fun watching streamers or your friends or just doing it yourself. It's all fun. Games with bad controls are funny and their value lies in the funnies and frustrations you get playing them. And because of that reason, bad controls are good. 